Hello everyone. Uh, to those of you that are just joining us, welcome to today's webinar, Catalyst for Change, Non-Governing Boards as Pipelines for Diverse, Equitable, and Inclusive Leadership. For those of you who are returning Foundation Center webinar participants, a warm welcome back. And to those of you who are here for the first time, I'm very glad that you're joining us today. My name is Julieta Mendez, and I will be supporting um, uh, today's webinar. Um, along with my colleague, Elizabeth Zavada, who will be managing polls, um, as well as collecting questions that you pose along the way and asking them during uh, the Q&A. Okay, and now I want to turn the controls over to our presenters, Annie Mohan and Heidi Kim, so they can display their presentation, and as they take the reins, I will introduce them. So Heidi is the Assistant Director of Pro Bono Programs at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, a nonprofit civil rights public interest law firm that matches nonprofits with pro bono attorneys. Heidi works with the uh, Pro Bono Advisory Council, a body of 40 young attorneys that serve as ambassadors for NYLPI's mission and coordinates several annual events geared toward junior attorneys. And our second presenter, Annie Mohan, is the manager of Pro Bono at Cad Wallader, Wickersham, and Taft LLP, an international law firm. Annie has been involved with Food Bank for New York City for several years in her position at uh, Cad Wallader and was recently elected chair of Food Bank for New York City's junior board. She plays a leadership role in the administration of the annual Justice Served campaign an effort led by New York City's legal community to close the, the city's meal gap. She also volunteers regularly at Food Bank's Harlem Community Kitchen and the food distribution warehouse in the Bronx. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Annie and Haiti so they can begin their presentation. Thank you for joining us, ladies. Thank you for having us. So we're going to start off uh, with our first poll question. Um, have you started having conversations about implementing a non-governing board within your organization? And, the, and so we have several answers. Thank you. We have several answers, um, options available for you. So you can either choose from, yes, we have a non-governing board. Um, yes, we are in the beginning stage of setting up a, a board. Or we have discussed it casually but have not made steps towards creating one. Or no, we have not discussed the issue, or finally, I'm not sure if this has been discussed at my organization. So we have uh, about 33%, the majority have said, we've discussed it casually, but haven't made steps to start. And that's followed by, yes, we have a non-governing board, 24%, and then 20% have said, yes, we are in the beginning stages of setting up a board. So it seems as the majority of the people that are in the audience have either discussed the subject or are in the process of working on it um, as well. What are your thoughts on that? Um, is this what you were expecting? Um, yeah, so I expect it to be a mix, and I think um, you know today's discussion will definitely be helpful regardless of what stage you are at with this process. Um, if you have a, a non-governing board in place, this would be um, a wonderful opportunity to learn a little bit more about how you could fill in gaps or you know, uh, inject some new energy into uh, what they're currently doing. Wonderful, all right. And so we have a second polling question. This is just to kind of um, set the stage here for both of our speakers. So we wanna know more about you and who's joining us, who's in the audience. So our second poll question is, how many full-time staff does your organization have? And we're showing here that 40% of the, of the organizations that are joining us today have between zero and five staff members. Uh, and that is then followed by the second biggest category, 23% is more than 50. Wow, that is quite, those are quite some extremes there. Yeah. Um, are, are you surprised by the representation and also by the fact that a big percentage of them are having these conversations at their organizations? Uh, yeah, it's interesting to see the spread, certainly. Um, I think that thinking about junior boards is important for organizations of all different sizes, um, but whether it's laying the groundwork or just thinking through strategically what it might look like at a point when your organization is ready to take something like that on, or if you if you already have one. Um, as Annie said, I think we'll have great tips for pretty much people at every different stage of, of this process. Wonderful. 
All right, we will continue on now with the presentation. Take it away, ladies. Sure. So uh, we thought it would be good to um, just do um, an explanation of what we are referring to when we speak about governing boards and non-governing boards. Um, so a governing board of a nonprofit is usually called a board of directors. Um, and they are uh, the governing body of a nonprofit and are charged by law with the oversight of a nonprofit. They are the fiduciaries who steer the organization towards a sustainable future by adopting sound ethical uh, and legal governance, as well as financial management policies. And they make sure that the organization has adequate resources to advance their mission. And as for any corporation, board members of nonprofits have three primary legal duties duty of care, duty of loyalty, duty of obedience. And um, being a board member um, does come with the risk of legal liability if there's um, any sort of failure or wrongdoing in these duties. When we speak of non-governing boards, um, we are referring to a group of young professionals, usually under or in their 40s, that support a nonprofit uh, leadership. Uh, junior board members have no fiduciary responsibility or official governing power of the nonprofit. Um, and they, use, they have unique mandates, but typically responsibilities involve fundraising, networking, uh, volunteering. Uh, members agree to lend their time and talent to raise support for the nonprofit. Um, they increase awareness of the mission by leveraging uh, resources and networks. So, in general, there are standing working groups created by nonprofits to assist staff and the board of directors um, in achieving their goals. They're committed stewards and advocates of a nonprofit. Um, so as we move on to our um, next slide and talk about our first sort of first framing question, which is why should your organization consider establishing a non-governing board? Annie has some thoughts we'll share. Sure. Um, so a non-governing board um, is one of the most powerful tools that a nonprofit can have in its toolbox um, for a couple of reasons. So one, um, Non-governing boards are essential for future planning, um, for you know staying relevant, and um, importantly, adding diversity to their leadership. Uh, our world is constantly changing, so staying relevant and connected to communities is essential for nonprofits, but can also be challenging. Um, they should be thinking long-term about the strategy and vision of the organization in order to help chart future course. Studies show that 83% of board members are over the age of 40, uh, have similar life experiences. Um, so, you know, the opportunity for a lack of diversity in vision, ideas, and thought is very high. Um, and that can present an issue in planning for the future and ensuring the nonprofit's message keeps resonating with its constituents. Non-governing boards, such as junior boards, are a great way of increasing diversity into an organization's leadership and future planning. Non-governing boards also help to enhance uh, an organization's recruiting, pipe, recruiting pipeline. They give leaders and senior staff of a nonprofit an opportunity to monitor and evaluate the leadership qualities of young talent. So uh, for a board of director recruitment now, um, the decision to date won't be solely based on third-party referrals, but rather on first-hand observations and experiences. Non-governing boards also uh, provide a way to connect to diverse interest groups and can create valuable new partnerships for an organization. So diversifying an organization's leadership with these young professionals whose skills and backgrounds differ from the governing board strengthens the ability to connect to community leaders, uh, potential new donors, volunteers, and tap markets. Um, millennials excel at collaborating. Um, and so putting that skill to work for the organization can help you connect to uh, diverse interest groups such as um, their schools and corporate employers. And last but not least, non-governing boards help to boost your fundraising potential. And so this is sort of related to the previous point about uh, connecting to diverse groups. Millennials are more focused on incorporating philanthropy into their professional brand more than any previous generation. Um, in fact, according to a Millennial Impact Report, 84% of Millennial employees uh, made a charitable donation in 2014, and 72% are interested in young professionals groups. So their connections, their tech savvy skills, their enthusiasm can help raise and source significant funds that the organization otherwise would not have seen. Um, so junior boards 
also give the organization um, that ability to cultivate young donors. Um, and while it might not be a significant amount as much as a governing board would be raising, again, it's still funds that the organization otherwise would not have um, been realized. Uh, great. So now we're going to move on to talking about, <coughs> pardon me, about some of the um, opportunities and challenges to design, facilitate, and manage such a group. Um, so I think uh, for us and, and for, for lots of junior board organizations, um, the, the, the major key is really to understanding the purpose of the non-governing board that you're setting up or are running. These purposes, of course, there can be multiple purposes, but it's a matter of identifying and knowing what it is that uh, is the most important to, to your organization. Is this group going to be fundraisers? Are they cheerleaders? Are they your brain trust? Identifying these purposes will also help you set expectations of the junior board members themselves, whether it's meeting attendance, personal contributions, event participation, or all of the above. Um, so these are some of the, I think this is the, the, the first big step that you need to take as you set up your junior board or as you look to, to manage your junior board is identifying the, the purpose of the organization, of the group. Right, and I agree. Defining uh, the role and expectations of the group is extremely important. I know um, in the beginning when we um, formed our junior board, um, you know, as with any new entity, we had some growing teams, but we were able to, you know, sit down, hash out exactly what it is um, with perspective from each member and the junior board as a whole. Um, and I think now we are definitely on the right track and have seen the gains of being able to sit and really define um, the rules and expectations. I think it's also important to remember that your purposes can change over time. Mm -hmm. um, when you first start out, maybe you have one goal in mind, uh, but as the group uh, becomes more robust, as you bring on new members, as people bring different sort of perspectives and, and leadership to the group, uh, the, the body can evolve itself, and it's important to keep that in mind as well. Um, talking about some of the tools to, to help one run well, I think leadership from within has actually been a tremendous, some of a tremendous impact on our junior board. Um, we elected two co-chairs from within the group and having planning committees and other sort of subcommittees uh, to run events or to work on you know, different different goal, keep a goal achieving achievements for us has been really helpful. Hearing from within the group, hearing from their peers often cuts through the noise in a way that a regular email from the staff person at the organization like myself uh, might do. And so uh, having those leaders inside it has been an essential step to, to moving it forward. Our junior board we've had for about 15 years actually, but it's the co-chairs we've only instituted in the last two years and it's really made a tremendous impact both on attendance and giving. Yes. Uh, and I agree. Um, so I, I think also in addition to um, having the group have these discussions and sort of leading from within, they also need to be managed. Um, so there needs to be a point person on staff within the organization that will drive strategy for the group, um, arrange meetings, answer questions, help with logistics. There sort of be a point person um, for uh, for the group and for each member of the group. Um, and what we could, you know, some organizations probably do ask members to take on some of that responsibility to sort of minimize um, staff time commitment. Um, but I do think that um, having someone that they could turn to um, is, you know, helpful and, and one of the best practices I would say of having a non building group. Absolutely. It's, it's both best practices, but honestly, it's also one of the challenges with running a junior mm -hmm. board. Um, it is pretty time intensive for, for the staff of an organization, so you have to think about whether you have the resources to really devote to the junior board. I find that it's really, on, it's, it's the more you put in, the more you'll get out, but that means you have to have the resources to put into it. Um, I, I work very closely with our co-chairs in terms of setting the agendas for the meetings, making sure they're prepared to lead the meetings, uh, with, in, in event planning and coordination, in the logistics of, of planning those things. And so it, it's definitely been a rewarding experience, uh, but that's one of the things you're gonna have to think about is, is it worth the, the manpower, the person power of your staff to put into running it successfully? Agree. And I mean, and some organizations are lucky enough to be able to have resources so they could outsource the management and recruitment um, to a consulting firm. But again, um, definitely um, important to have a point person um, that they could turn to. Great. Uh I also want to talk about the fact that um, of how do we how do we engage members when they are on the drinker board? And I've actually found that um, 
more is more in a, in a similar way to the resources that you put in. People like to be asked. Uh, they like to be asked to be on junior boards. They like participating. They like having uh, an insider's view to an organization that they care about. When we bring in a new class of members, we often find that they're the most engaged. They attend the most meetings. They're enthusiastically asking what else they can be doing. Um, so it's, it's one of those situations where sometimes we feel like we're asking too much of these people, but we find, in fact, that the more opportunities we give them to engage with us, the more excited they are to work with us and to become ambassadors for our organization. Uh, in, in terms of um, how you can find members, uh, there's a really wide array of people a wide, a wide array of ways people can come to you. You can look at your volunteer ranks if you have opportunities where people are actually volunteering directly with your organization. That's a great way to tap people who are already knowledgeable and engaged with your mission. Uh, you can talk to your board members and others in your network. You can think about whether these people are going to strengthen or create new connections to the supporting institutions that you already have relationships with. And uh, you want these people to be excited and passionate about what it is that you do. You want them to be able to tell their friends about the great organizations they are now a part of. You want them to be able to sell tickets to events and spread the word on social media. Okay, and well, that, that's sort of my story. So I've, like uh, Lisa mentioned at uh, the beginning of this um, session, I have been, um, you know, working with Food Bank for several years now, and uh, the, by the law firm, um, where I managed the Provana program actually incorporate, uh, incorporated Food Bank 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so they've always sort of been, um, you know, part of my professional life and eventually sort of came into my um, to my personal life. And I realized it was something I cared about and was ecstatic to be asked um, when the junior board was being formed um, to not just be a member, to, but to, you know, head up um, that initiative. So again, you know, to just to piggyback on what Heidi is saying, um, you know, start there. Start looking at your volunteers because that, to me, is a testament of how um, they feel about the organization's mission. So that might be a great place to start um, when trying to form a non-governing board. Great. Um, any other thoughts you'd like to share about uh, about managing the junior board? Um, yeah. So, for, um, like you said, sort of um, leading from within. So I think you you can let the junior board manage itself and build itself. Um, and I think recruiting is one of the tasks that most of the board um, members enjoy, telling their friends about it, um, telling coworkers about it. Um, so, you know, again, I would say let them build themselves, let them be involved in the recruiting of um, new board members, prospects, um, let them screen resumes, conduct interviews, um, and engage the um, actual board of directors. I think overseeing um, a junior board can be a function of one of the board members. And it's a great way for um, for non-governing board members to really um, see leadership experience for business at first hand. So it's a great um, learning tool for them. Um, board members can host meetings, attend junior board events, liaise with and mentor the junior board. I think millennials um, enjoy, um, would, would enjoy that experience. Um, and they find that a valuable benefit um, to being part of a non-governing board. So I think when managing them, that should be one of the, um, the I guess, the, the tools that you put into place where there's some sort of mentoring program so they see the benefit to them being a part of this non-governing board. Um, and let them put on their thinking caps. Um, they're full of ideas, enthusiasm. Um, let them brainstorm, brainstorm in ways that they can help the organization. Um, obviously, again, they do need to be managed, but let them focus where they want to, and you'll see they'll come up with terrific ideas. Um, show them that you care. You want them to feel valued and cherished um, for what they're doing for the organization. Um, again, I met, you know, and I mentioned mingling with the board because I think at um, most of um, most of them are tend to be at that stage in their um, professional careers where, um, you know, having contact with leaders in industries that they hope to be or they're aspiring to be leaders in, um, having that interaction is um, a motivator for them. So, again, I think you should incorporate that into your structure um, and organize regular social interaction between the two groups as well. Um, invite your non-governing boards to meetings. Um, keep them in the loop on strategic challenges that the board is working on. Let them know about new programming. Um, you know, perhaps consider inviting them to board committee meetings. Some boards um, get periodic reports from a member of the junior board, um, the chair of the junior board. 
Um, in terms of managing them, I think you, again we need to you need to set out um, expectations, like fundamental expectations, um, as to let them know what their uh, service requirements are, what their gift gets are, um, and be firm, give a due date for when those things are expected to be completed. Um, also be flexible, allow multiple um, participation paths for members. Some of them are stronger in certain areas than others are. Um, and I guess just, you know, really make this a mutually beneficial relationship. And, a, you know, you'll see that a properly managed um, non-governing board can be a tremendous value to nonprofits. Great. I want to touch on one of the things that Annie mentioned, which is the financial commitment, because it's often a challenge that organizations talk about, whether it's having a difficult time having the conversation to begin with, with, with prospective junior board members, or even board members, frankly, um, and also having the, the, the junior board members themselves live up to that expectation. Again, this is where I think setting the expectations and being really clear is, is essential. Um, you'll actually see in your handouts, we've shared one of the documents that we share with prospective, we call our junior board the PBAC, the proposal advisory council um, and we, we put in there this is this is the expected financial contribution that you make and we have we give that per, to a person as we're having the conversation so it doesn't feel so stark or so shocking to them um, and frankly it's part of their training to become governance board members because mm -hmm. being on a governing board a financial contribution is absolutely expected of you. Mm -hmm. And so in the way that a, a non-governing board can be a stepping stone for younger professionals as they start to think about board service, um, financial giving is, is absolutely a component of that. And that being said, it can, it can feel awkward to have a conversation about money, but again, these are people who should be passionate about your mission, and, they, and that passion should extend to financial support. And that doesn't mean it has to be a high dollar amount. Um, it can be something, and it can be something they can also fundraise to, to make their contribution. Um, but I think it's, it's part of their commitment to your organization to show that they are serious about who you are and serious about your mission and supporting you. <clears throat> Um, the, but it can be a challenge certainly for organizations. Um, in terms of other challenges, any do you have thoughts on, on some of those? Um, I guess, um, you know, again, not, I don't know that it's so much of a challenge, but um, nonprofits um, have to all have to realize that the return on their investment in a non-governing board um, isn't immediate. Um, you know, there are long-term benefits that are in place. Young donors now will become your major donors in the future. And as you mentioned, um, you know, training these non-governing boards to eventually become leaders of an organization is very valuable. Um, you know, establishing a young junior board will take time and effort. And um, again, it just, you know, it may seem taxing, but I guarantee it will pay off in the long run. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's very much true. Um, we've had several members of our junior board actually move to our governing board. Mm -hmm. So again, it's something where you're seeing long-term investment in people and long-term uh, return on that investment. Um, another challenge that I've seen is as much as people are engaged and passionate about the mission, we have quarterly meetings and we're always looking for different opportunities for people to provide feedback and actually participate rather than having us sort of sitting and talking at them and reporting back to them on things that have already happened. Um, so creating opportun meaningful opportunities where people can really give you their feedback um, is, is, has, can be a challenge and it's something to really, again, think about as you set your goals for the group. Um, you know, whether it's uh, we're going to plan two events per year or we're going to plan a major fundraiser, um, really trying to engage with the group also and finding out what they want to achieve for, by, by participating in the body, I think will help tackle some of those challenges. So um, we're going to just move on to our next question. Uh, Non-governing boards serve as a training ground for a more diverse set of leaders. How do you use a non-governing board as an opportunity to find new talent and promote diversity and inclusion practices? So I can um, start off. Uh, so just to give a little bit of context of um, why uh, we are talking about uh, promoting diversity and inclusion practices um, via non-governing boards. Um, having a, you know, leadership with diverse perspectives is critically important. Um, with the diversity of experience, expertise, and perspective, a nonprofit is in a stronger position to plan for the future, manage risks, make prudent decisions, and take full advantage of opportunities. And a diverse board that is also sensitive to cultural differences is usually one that has the strongest capacity to attract and retain talented leaders. 
um, as well as stay in touch with um, their needs of their communities. According to board, search, board source research done in 2017, the diversity of boards today has not increased over the past two years and seems unlikely to change based on current recruitment practices. These findings are extremely disheartening given all the attention that diversity, inclusion, and equity have received over the past few years. According to another report from BoardSource, a third of 1,300 nonprofit CEUs surveyed in 2017, um, not that long ago, said that their boards are 100% white and only 45% are women. So that means a lot of important voices are not being invited to the table for nonprofit leadership. Uh, organizational science shows that a lack of diversity creates blind spots for organizations, leaving them out of sync with their communities. So organizations have to realize that they are putting themselves at risk when they fail to diversify um, as this lack of cognitive diversity constrains effective decision making. Fostering diversity takes sustained and intentional action and should be an organizational priority. It should be a part of a nonprofit's mission and not just its mission statement. So forming non-governing boards and purposely, purposefully recruiting diverse members can be a starting point or a catalyst for change to address this diversity deficit in nonprofit leadership. Non-governing boards are a great way to cultivate new leaders who can expand the board and organization's collective cultural awareness. Great. Um, I think Annie really hits the nail on the head on, on so many of the uh, points that she made there. Um, one of the other things, the elements I think for a junior board, um, and this is true across you know many industries, uh, but particularly in, in the legal industry, which is which is our nonprofit organization. But um, the junior and lower ranks of, of professionals tend to be more diverse than the upper ranks of leaderships are, which is why junior boards can often be far more diverse than a governing board is, and that's certainly the case for our organization which is why I think non-governing boards are such a great opportunity to promote diversity. Um, my organization, New York Lawyers of the Public Interest, is very much committed to serving underserved communities, and by reflecting the diversity of the communities we serve in our leadership bodies, it, it lends us, <coughs> pardon me, um, it allows us to, to meaningfully, more meaningfully uh, communicate to those communities that, that, uh, that, we, that diversity is an important value to our organization. Um, if, I may, if I may just um, interrupt, Briefly, one of our um, audience members uh, was just asking if we could, you know, for clarification purposes, um, just specify that millennials now are in the age between the ages of 25 and 40, um, and you know they just kind of felt that that was an important thing to to point out that they're young, but they're also not that young anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, millennials. No offense to you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I just wanted to point that out before we, we kept yep. going. Um, and then also, um, if, if I think we could just go a little slower. I, I think some people are, are, are having a little bit of a hard time following, but you know, you guys are doing a great job. So, you know, you can just relax now and <laughs> <laughs> slow <laughs> down a little. Okay. We can slow down a little. We can slow down a little. For you, um, yeah, um, you know, diversity, the other thing, to, I think one of the other things to keep in mind is that diversity means many things across many metrics. Um, there's certainly, of course, diversity of, of race and ethnicity, gender, gender expression, um, but it also means life experience and priorities and perspectives. A lot of those things, of course, are aligned with some of the more traditional diversity metrics, but um, for example, our governing board at New York Lawyers of the Public Interest are all senior partners and counsel. They're all lawyers at law firms and corporate legal departments. Um, uh, so for us, even having an accountant on our junior board is, is a diverse candidate um, in some sense of, of a different profession and a different way of thinking and approaching problems. Um, so it's important to open yourself up to thinking about um, what diversity means. I think it's also important to keep in mind that diversity is not a box that we check or something that we achieve and then we're done. It's an mm -hmm. ongoing conversation um, and it's something that, that evolves over time. Uh, it's not something we do for the sake of saying that we're diverse. Um, we do it because it's important to have different voices in the room that are lending different perspectives. Um, we've been running our, our junior board for 15 years, so sometimes we get used to the way we do things. It's the way we've always done it. Um, and so having just people who haven't even been part of the organization come to us and, and ask questions and probe um, is an important part of our process in, in thinking about are we continuing to meet our goals? Are we continuing to meet the needs uh, that we've set out to do? Uh, and then. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, you know, there, there's no magic wand, you know, for, for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, but I think the 
the, the way you really try to make it a goal is you, you make it an explicit priority. As we recruit junior board members, it's one of the top things that we think about and frankly that we talk about when we reach out to our connections. Um, we make it a top level goal. So it's not something that happens after the fact. It's not something that um, is, it's, it's nice if it works out. Uh, it's, it's absolutely part of our, our major goals from the outset. Right. And just to piggyback on what um, Heidi said, um, when finding new talent, be explicit when recruiting. Um, look for candidates with a variety of professional expertise, cultural backgrounds, um, you know, geographic reach, spectrum of life experiences, who can help the organization respond to future needs, um, and set goals for building and expanding the non-governing board in certain areas. Um, so when you're meeting with prospects, you should start evaluating candidates with those goals in mind and share them with the junior board, and share them with the um, other leaders at the organization. Um, and, you know, let them know what you're looking for when you're considering prospects. Um, and then, you know, once you've got this new talent, you should also be, you know, have a thoughtful on onboarding process once they're on board um, because they'll be looking for mentors within and, um, you know, establishing those relationships can help them, you know, help knit together a really great group um, of diverse leaders. Uh, and, you know, keep in mind what you like to, um, your board of directors to look like in the future. Um, consider where the organization is going, what skills, experiences, um, contacts, personal, professional backgrounds um, will be most helpful to you in the short term, uh, not only in the short term, but in the future, and use that information to cultivate um, a non-governing board. And um, I guess finally for me, I think think about the constituents you serve um, and consider having them represented um, on your non-governing board. I know at Food Bank, um, we work with a thousand member each, over a thousand member agencies um, throughout New York City. Um, and there's two kitchens, pantries, um, and we actually have one of the leaders of uh, Brooklyn, um, well, not just the soup kitchen, they do a lot of holistic <coughs> services. Um, to the underprivileged, and we have a young leader on our board, and I think that adds great value um, and definitely adds diversity to the way that we think um, and how we plan um, for you know our programming for the year. So our next uh, poll question here is, which of the following will you prioritize as a next step when building out your non-governing board? I think we have a really good representation right now of of our audience. So we're going to close the poll. And what we're seeing here, um, what we're seeing here is that 33% uh, so so 32 percent are saying that, you know, raising awareness of their cause or organization is a priority, followed by making the organization more inclusive and then boosting fundraising. So those, they, they don't seem very surprising to me, right? I think uh -huh. at, the end, at the end of the day, a nonprofit organization has priorities that they need to achieve and definitely raising awareness of, of the work that they do is, is incredibly important um, uh, as well as as well as fundraising. Uh, what are your thoughts on the responses, please? Um, I think it falls pretty much in line with um, what, what the goals of most organizations are in setting up a, a, a non-governing organization, um, and then raising awareness of the cause organization, again, finding people who are passionate about you from your volunteer ranks, from your supporting institutions, I think um, this is a, definitely an achievable goal for you, um, and engaging those people to, to do events or share about your organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and, and, you know, raising awareness, again, can definitely be done, and I talk about, you know, the younger generations being tech savvy, um, it's very good at networking and collaborating. Um, so yeah, you know, I think all these fall in line with, um, you know, what should drive the formation of a non-governing board. A couple of the responses that came in under the other section are um, increasing support for the organization uh, and access to, do, to more diverse skills. Uh, that is kind of their priority. Um, somebody else said they need to evaluate staff time versus the benefit for them, right? So, so what is the, what what benefit will creating a non-governing board bring to the organization versus the staff time that it will take to create one? Um, another response said uh, our organization is already very inclusive, but it is critical for us that the populations we serve are represented and have a voice in our work. Um, and I think that's a great way to definitely ensure that you are being, you know, that you are representing your community, obviously, in the work yeah. that you do. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so thank you everyone for uh, the responses that you've submitted. We're going to close the poll now and we're going to continue uh, with our next topic here, which is, I believe, uh, board success. Uh, great. So we're going to talk about what success looks like for a non-governing board. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there, this is extremely open-ended. There's no one right solution um, for what success might look like. But um, I think, if anything, one of the major things that's emerged here is really, you know, being clear, being explicit about what your goals are, what you want to achieve. And so um, I think success really means feeling like you're you're achieving that goal that you set out, that you feel like it's worth what you're putting into it. And I know it's hard to sort of make that assessment in advance without knowing what it is you're going to have to put into it. Um, so part of it is, I think, doing as much of the groundwork as you can and then giving it a shot and seeing how it goes. And like I said earlier, these are things that evolve over time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our, our junior board has grown both in, in number and in, in, in goals and, and things that we've done together as a group. Um, and we've, you know, formalized a lot of things as time has gone on. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, I think it's important to, to be flexible with, with your goals and what success looks like to you, um, and in terms of what you had identified at the outset, whether it was raising money, whether it's um, being your ambassadors. Annie, what do you think? Um, no, I agree. I think um, for me, I, being chair of the Bank Junior Board, um, I we actually do um, biannual report cards for everyone, just so that we do some level setting and everyone um, understands where they sort, sort of um, fall um, at certain times during the year. And so I measure success by um, engagement. So <clears throat> everyone won't hit every benchmark. Everyone won't hit, won't hit their gift gap. But there, again, are fundamental expectations. So I uh, measure success um, by engagement. But like you said, um, there are, you know, that could be sort of an open-ended um, question, right? How, how success is measured. Um, again, identifying what the goal of the group is and setting benchmarks. Um, or great way to be able to track um, how a group is performing. Yeah, absolutely. I actually really like the report card. Um, we do want something similar as well. And it's a way for us to get a holistic view of, of a person's engagement. So on there would be included meeting attendance, um, event participation, mm -hmm. personal contributions. And then, of course, there's always sort of a miscellaneous or other catch-all. And it's a, it's a really important thing to think about because, for example, we have a member who, who doesn't live in a geographic area, so is not able to attend meetings. Um, but, you know, they're financially supporting us. But more importantly than that, he's super enthusiastic about the organization. He's someone I know I can call up at any time, and he'll spend some time talking to me about a new idea that we have. Um, I know he's someone who shares it widely with his social network, his professional network. And those are absolutely things of value. So I think you can definitely be flexible with people in terms of, of how they're engaging with you, as Annie said. Um, it's not just checking the box off. Because after all, someone could attend meetings and they could give contributions, but they could not be that engaged with the organization. It could be sort of a perfunctory thing to them. And that's not what you want either. Uh, so I do think that you should be aiming for um, people participating <clears throat> meaningfully uh, mm -hmm. in one way or another. And again, that can be through attendance at events and meetings or through giving uh, financially, ideally it's both. Um, but those are, again, open-ended goals. Um, it's, yeah. At no point are we ever done reaching those goals. Um, but we've uh, we've had year-over-year -year success, especially in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. with increasing those numbers. So I absolutely feel like our junior board is, is a, an investment that's absolutely worth our time. Yeah. I also think it's important not only to just sort of check off what, what you know, the individual and group performance, but also to measure their satisfaction as well. So ask questions, you know, how effectively has the nonprofit staff um, communicated with you? How responsive have they been? Um, how do you feel like you've been fully utilized this year? How um, engaged were you overall? What can we improve? Um, so I think all, you know, again, not just checking off, um, you know, have they done this, have they done that, but also speaking to them, having a conversation to see how to make, again, this it comes up again, make this relationship mutually beneficial for them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, the, their satisfaction and engagement is as important to us mm -hmm. um, as, as us sort of getting our getting getting the value for us. Um, and 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 really, I think the ideal junior board member is someone that. I, as a staff member, can pick up the phone and just call at any time and really get their temperature read. Um, so it's really rewarding when we have our events or our social events in particular where people come and say, I'm so glad I'm part of the family of the organization. I'm proud to be a, a member of the junior board of the organization, and I feel like I'm getting a lot out of, out of being on, on the senior board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, great. So I think that's about it for our framing questions. Mm -hmm. um, 
Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I should have showed that slide earlier. Uh, great. Um, thank you both very much. That was all wonderful information to have. And we do have a series of questions here that have already come in um, from our audience, our, our audience members. Um, for those of you that still need a few minutes to submit your questions, please do so. Um, and we will try to get to as many as, as we can. Um, we do have uh, some time right now to, to do that. So um, we'll start first with um, our first question is from Daniel. Um, and he's asking, uh, does a non-governing board, by definition, also include committees? Um, I wouldn't say by definition, but you could, depending on the size of your non-governing board. Mm -hmm. um, I think committees are helpful. Um, it helps with distributing leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and so have, you know, to have, you could delegate, uh, you know, event planning or volunteer service. So you could have smaller committees. So again, not by definition. I think that's the great thing about um, non-governing boards. They can be customizable to fit every organization's needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have anything to add to that? Maybe? Okay. Great. Uh, the second question from Greg is, um, what do you estimate the staff commitment required to manage a junior board effectively? And I think that also came up earlier in one of the comments, right? Yeah. How much time does this, does this take? And, uh, and I think kind of related to that question is, uh, from maybe she asks, how many members for a junior board would be manageable, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so again, speaking from experience, um, and I believe my contact from Foodbank is actually um, uh, listening in, but we speak a lot. Um, being chair of the junior board, she keeps me informed on what's happening on you know the food bank side, so that I could inform members. Um, she helps me prepare agendas for our monthly calls. Our we just had our annual retreat, so it is a significant amount of time. Um, but again, I think it sort of depends on the goals of the junior board, um, what structures you have in place. Um, I think I um, I might be a little bit more on the rigid side with um, our junior board. We have monthly calls, we have in-person meetings, we have volunteer service. Um, so that requires some help from the um, from Food Bank and um, they've been very, very generous with um, allowing us to have time and resources from the organization. Um, again, I still think it can be customizable, but in order for it to be effective, at least from the get-go, um, setting up the foundation and the fundamentals, it, it will require, um, I can't put a number on it, but a significant amount of time from staff from the organization. Um, I would I would agree with that, um, and again, you're going to have to think about what the goals of the, for the group are. So for our junior board, we have quarterly in-person meetings. We also have our own annual fundraiser, and then we usually plan two to three other events sort of throughout the year that are related to um, professional development and also programmatic uh, for, for our organization. So for each quarterly meeting, we I work with the co-chairs to set the agenda, and uh, we do a prep call in advance of those meetings. Meetings are hosted at, uh, for us at our office uh, at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Then we also uh, have to put in a lot of work for our events. Now for us, we are 15 plus years into our junior board, mm -hmm. so it's a pretty well-oiled machine. Mm -hmm. um, some of our events, we have sort of a, a whole roster of like, different kinds of events that we've done in the past. And so we, we, we sort of, we, we know what we're doing in terms of um, we have our tried and true uh, uh, techniques and, and protocols and procedures to do those events. So I would say starting out, it's, it's going to be more intensive than, than when you're sort of in, right. have, have, you know, have found, have found your, your cadence uh, for, for doing those events. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, it definitely does take, take a, a big chunk of my time, and particularly, you know, in the prep for a particular event as we're in, in the lead up to it. Um, in the month before, you know, our, our junior board fundraiser, a lot of my time, the bulk of my time is really going to, to working on the fundraiser. Um, but, you know, in the two month gap between that and our next quarterly meeting, it's not as intensive. So uh, I think that having, again, engaged members is, is really key to that because they take some of the load off of you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know Annie personally, and I know she's a tremendous uh, chair to her to her junior board. And um, we're, and, and we are both are very lucky, but, you know, <laughs> Annie's don't come, come along very often. Um, Thanks, so. are you listening? <laughs> Yeah, um, and so so it's 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 a give and take, and and, and uh, 
uh, I, I do think it fits a lot. Um, in terms of the question of, of how many members are manageable, again, I think at the outset you want to start probably smaller than when, mm -hmm. you, when you sort of figured out the formula for what works for you, and there's no magic number to put on that. Um, but you have to. I, I find that the number of people you want to be able to call everyone in your roster. I think in a week. Mm -hmm. So you don't want a hundred people on a junior board. That's mm -hmm. not manageable. And the fact is, you know, ten super engaged people is more useful than thirty not so engaged people. Okay. And it sort of ties into how much time um, a staff member can commit to managing that too, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we at uh, T Bank, we are a, a board of sixteen, a junior board of sixteen, um, and we have at least one um, main contact at food bank, but we have access to everyone, and but primarily about two or three people um, are our go-to, so to speak. So I think yeah. we also have to take that into account too when planning for um, the size of um, a non-governing board. Yeah. 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 But, but when you say, Heidi, when you say that, you know, you should start small, I mean, what comes to your mind when you think of small? Are you thinking 10 is small, or do you think even 5 is, is acceptable? Um, would you say like don't you know I don't go you know with less than you know maybe less than five is a little too too little too small probably I would say between five and ten between five and ten yeah. okay starting place okay. Um, and again a lot of junior boards I know um, start or coalesce around like a major event like they do like sort of one fundraiser that's that's their own so again finding five passionate people that's a task in and of itself right yeah. it's, it's, it's okay. a starting place yeah. Um, you know, I mean, our junior board is 40, and uh, there's a lot of, ah. yes, it's a big junior board. Um, and there's a lot of dynamics of the sort of yeah. how we got to 40, um, and for us, it's, it's very much tied to And are you the point person, just one? Uh, my son and Marnie, our, okay. our, our director of program programs, and then we also have support from our development staff as well. Okay. So, so really, yeah, there's there's a couple of us, and, and Anna Maria San Marino also supports um, our, our junior board organization. So there's there's a lot of us who, who really come together to, to support that group. Um, and so... Uh, I sort of lost my train of thought, but um, I'm sorry. Oh no, no it's okay. Yeah. No, no. Um, finding, yeah, finding five super engaged people who are excited to throw a trivia night, or you know, a wine and cheese party, you know, at one of their homes where each person brings three friends. Yeah. And now mm -hmm. you've certain, now you've reached 15 new people who didn't know about your organization. That's a great goal for us to start off with. Right. Um, and, and you can so you can definitely start small. You don't have to come out the gate with you know, a big gala fundraiser that's going to have 200 people come to right. it. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's great. That's great advice. Um, on that note, uh, how, how does a nonprofit, so let's say that you begin with five to ten, you know, uh, a small a small non-governing board. Um, how do you begin to measure diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, in leadership? Like, how do you know that you really are being diverse um, with your, with your non-governing board, with your leadership team? Any thoughts yeah. on that? I mean, that's a, it's a tough question. I mean, I think one of the things that I said earlier is that, you know, it, it, diversity is obviously not something that you do it and then you're done and then you don't think about right, it anymore. Right, right. Um, I think it's fluid. Yeah, it's fluid and it's something mm -hmm. you just have to constantly think about and, and continually keep in mind. And again, why do we keep it in mind? It's because we want different voices in the room who mm -hmm. will bring their different perspectives. Um, so I think, so for us, because of also the size of our, our junior board, we're constantly almost always thinking about new members and uh, cycling people off and cycling people on. So again, as long as we keep that top of mind in our recruitment process, and it sort of naturally just becomes part of the, the rhythm and, and the language that we're using as we, as we think about our junior board. Yeah. yeah. So we, we um, have a lot of interest expressed in our junior board, and what we look for is, um, is that industry already represented um, on our junior board. We have folks from legal, financial, from the culinary industry, from, you know, entertainment. Um, so that's one of the things we look for when someone expresses an interest. Um, so for me, that is where I see our diversity really come into um, to play, where how we measure um, really, you know, the industries we represent it because one of our goals is to have these GD board members leverage their networks. Um, so we're very mindful when selecting selecting new members. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Heidi, you mentioned a, a very important point. I think making sure that you have cycles for your board for your non-governing board members and they understand those cycles is important. Um, it helps it helps them also stay motivated, knowing that you know there is an end term to this and you you might want to make the most out of it. Creates um, an urgency. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. It creates an urgency. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
Um, related to that, uh, one of our audience members is asking, what criteria do you use in evaluating potential non-governing board members? Now, Annie, you were just talking yeah. about how you know you make sure that you have people from various industries represented on your board. Some people might want to make sure that they have their, their community that they serve represented mm -hmm. on the non-governing board. Any other thoughts on how to evaluate? Well, we also look at how um, how have you interacted with the organization in the board? What do you know about Food Bank? Have you volunteered with us? Mm -hmm. um, because we want to be sure, again, that it is a right fit for us both, the organization and the member. Um, so there is actually sort of an educational piece before um, someone gets selected. We have them volunteer. Um, they're uh, soft interviewed by a few people. Um, we just want to be sure, again, that um, they're familiar with what the mission is, they're passionate about it, they, under they understand their expectations. Um, yeah, that's sort of how we kind of navigate the recruiting um, uh, yeah, we did something similar. It's definitely some conversations, um, making sure, I mean, for us, for New York lawyers of the public interest, we don't necessarily have the name brand that, that Food Bank does. Um, so, uh, you know, we generally want to hear about their commitment to pro bono work, to social justice organizations and nonprofit organizations, even if it wasn't specifically us. Um, but I'd like, I'd like to hear from them what it is about our mission, because we do lots of different things that, that's interesting to them. Um, I'd like to hear about what, sort of what their goals are and what it is they hope to get out of being on a junior board. Um, and also, I just want to hear excitement and enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Again, um, you know, having an engaged, active junior board member is fantastic, and having someone who's sort of doing it, maybe check their own boxes, is not that useful for, for really either of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and so making sure that this is something that, that genuinely excites them um, as, as being part of the organization is, is really important. Yeah, I was, I was actually going to rephrase the question asking, what do you not what do you what do you not look for, right? What turns when you're talking to someone, when you're interviewing someone, what turns you off to them? So I think that it's really hard as a nonprofit organization when you have volunteers knocking at your door saying, Hey, I want to represent you uh, or I want to advocate for your mm -hmm. cause, your organization, it's really hard to say no because mm -hmm. you want as many advocates and you know as and cheerleaders as possible. Um, but you know, what are those little things that would would make you say no to that person, right? Mm -hmm. That would raise those red flags, um, uh, and and or would make you think twice about whether or not engaging them. Right. So I wouldn't turn them away from the organization, maybe from the board. Um, I, I don't know that that's really come up. Um, I do think if some, not so much that would turn me off, but if some, we are saturated with a particular industry on the board, um, we try to find another path for that person to be supportive of Food Bank. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of, again, I don't know that I've come across really any um, turn off, but again, turning away people from the organization, um, if someone's offering support, um, there's not a seat for them at the non-governing board table. We try to find a different path um, mm -hmm. within the organizations to make sure that um, they're able to follow through with their passion and we're, you know, leveraging um, how th that passion with our mission. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, similarly, I can't, I'm trying to think of an occasion where it might have happened. Yeah. I, I do think one time we had someone who was at a particular law firm who wanted to recommend someone else at the same law firm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and in some, so similarly, like, right. kind of oversaturated right. like, representing, representation from a particular company or industry. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, and that's something where, again, we, we, can, we can have that kind of candid conversation with sort of the recommending member and letting them know maybe why it's not a good fit right now. But again, mm -hmm. we don't want to, we never want to turn away someone who's excited right. about being Right, participating with you, right. whether it's finding a volunteer opportunity for them or putting them on your list to serve, they can hear more news about that person, keeping them on a short list for future openings uh, on, on the junior board. I think it's, it's a way to, to, to make sure that we're not turning people away. Great, great. Um, we do have Lily in the audience who is giving a shout out saying that Food Bank for New York City loves our junior board chair, Annie, <laughs> and that we just couldn't do it without you. So I just, I wanted to share that. I did not pay her to say that. Not at all. No. I really. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us, Lily. We're glad to, we're glad to have you there. Um, uh, our next question is from Tim, and he's asking, uh, is there often a dedicated budget set aside for board members' professional growth, or is that not typical for nonprofit board governance? Uh, we we do not have that um, for professional growth. I rely on my connections. I rely on senior leadership at the organization. I rely on the board members to sort of help 
cultivate and develop um, my junior board. Okay. There's no budget. There's no budget. Yes. Yeah. 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 Any thoughts? Yeah, I, I we similarly don't. Um, I I can't say that I've heard of nonprofits setting aside budgets for their for, for that, but that doesn't mean yeah. it doesn't happen. Right. Right. Um, yeah. But I I don't come across that. Yeah. Great. Um, speaking of diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, here's a very interesting question posed by Jackie. What are the thoughts on the age of non-governing and junior board members? Uh, it's an interesting question, particularly for New York lawyers, because we started our junior board with very explicitly with the intent that these are people who are in the sort of junior to mid-level associate range at law firms, mm -hmm. um, but we have people who have been on since the, since its inception. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they were junior attorneys when they joined, but they're not junior attorneys <laughs> anymore. Um, and so there's been a, a real question, because these are people who have stayed on, if they've stayed on for 10 plus years, it's because they love us, mm -hmm. and we love them, and we don't want to see them right. you know, go uh, from our junior board. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I, I, I don't want to set an arbitrary age cutoff or job title cutoff or anything. Um, I, I but it's, it's an ongoing question, certainly even for us. And, and frankly, it's sort of a good question to have because you're talking about how do you how do you best use someone who has continued to stay engaged with your organization? It's a good problem to yeah. have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, not the materials I, that I've seen usually was 25 to 45. But again, I don't have any kind of age goal in mind or yeah. Mm -hmm. We tend to call them young professional boards or junior boards, you know, to sort of to set them off from governing boards, which governing boards, I think, Andy, is a statistic, you know, for the most part, these people are over the age of 45, 50, I mean, I think yeah. our governing board probably averages even higher than that. Yeah. Um, for sure. um, for yeah. legal services organizations in particular, I think it's often senior partners and counsel, so, so it's, it's much more about that contrast than it is a particular age number, I think. Mm -hmm. So, so this could be either a junior board, it could also be an advisory board, yeah. for example. Yeah, and I think that too, you also have to be mindful of, I know it sounds, you know, like you know, just a, a small um, uh, prickle, but you have to be careful, I think, with names, because that also sets the expectations of what people are coming into. So if you are planning an event, and you're looking for an event um, planning group, you probably shouldn't call that a junior board. Um, if you're looking for a group to just fundraise, you may not want to call that a junior board. Um, so I think the you know naming your non-governing board is significant. Mm -hmm. We don't call our junior board a junior board. We call them the Pravota Advisory Council or you know, advisory body, advisory committee. A lot of these terms are actually really interchangeable. Um, I think we're using junior board pretty frequently as again to set off from a governing board. But junior board can sound pejorative and it can sound like well then it's like the big kids board or the, mm -hmm. the, the big board is, is sort of the official board. Um, I consider both of our bodies to be absolutely essential for our organization. Right. Uh, so, right. But anyway, that's, that's a very good distinction to make and, and, and to, to clarify for the audience. Thank you. Um, kind of continuing on this conversation with age, um, Carla actually asks on the other spectrum is if you're trying to engage um, youth that are under 18 to be a part of a non governing board. Um, is it okay to offer uh, financial incentives or some sort of stipend um, to kind of, yeah, to help them out to be able to attend non uh, the meetings and things like that? Under 18? Under 18. Um, so I work at a law firm, so I see a lot of <laughs> liability issues here. Okay. Um, we're very particular, I mean, even just with volunteering at um, Food Bank, not only Food Bank, but other organizations that I've volunteered with, um, working with, um, I guess, groups that are under 18, I think requires a lot more care. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sorry, the question about money, what was that? Yes, it was, um, should stipends be offered or financial incentives to youth under 18 to be on and attend meetings of a non-governing board? Have you, yes, have you come I have across not, that? I have not come across. Yeah, I've never come across that. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to speak on. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't really. It's, um, yeah, but you but what you're saying is it it will it would require additional. Uh, yeah, I think attention, attention, care. Um, I, you know, I, I depending on. I mean, I all I can think of for under 18 or like high school group mm -hmm. um, as a non-governing body. I've never come across it, but I do think that will definitely require a lot more thought. Um, 
than I mean, what we Yeah, I mean as best practices your governing board should not be compensated. I know we're talking about non governing board yeah. here. So governing board members should not be compensated. Right. And volunteers you have to be really careful, even if they're a volunteer and I know that's not distinct from, from the governing boards, but um, in terms of providing stipends and compensation to volunteers as well. So I think Annie's right, I think you have to be really careful and just yeah. give a lot of thought and consideration. It sounds more like an internship if we're giving stipend <coughs> or something, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this next question here is from Katie, and she's asking: Is there a reason a junior board cannot be managed by a by the governing board as opposed to staff? Um, any thoughts on that? I mean, um, is there a reason they cannot? Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think they cannot be managed. Um, by a board member, if a board member wants to be tasked with sort of being the liaison between the junior board and the organization, um, I think that would be a great opportunity for both the junior board to have access to a board member and for a board member to sort of pass on um, knowledge and expertise um, for, gov you know, best practices for a governing junior board. Um, again, it does take time, so I don't know, um, most board of directors tend to um, not be able to not not have you know a lot of time to afford to doing such. So I imagine they would probably still need some kind of staff support from the organization. But again, I do I, I think that's a great idea to have a board member involved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, related to that, uh, and is there any? Um, do you have any examples, or have you come across any junior boards that are actually involved in the activities of a governing board? So, for example, many governing boards have committees, right? You have like the finance committee, you have the programs committee, et cetera. Do you ever find this kind of crossover where you have somebody from the junior board that's also joining some of the committees of the governing board? And would you recommend that? So we actually do invite our, our, our junior board co-chairs to join our governing board meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, where the governing board actually has legal duties, including like, voting on our budget and you know, voting on, on other issues, <coughs> pardon me, set forth before the board, um, you know, non-governing board members don't have you know voting rights, um, mm -hmm. so that's something to keep in mind. Um, they're also part of our pro bono committee, with the pro bono committee of our governing board. Um, so yeah, I think I think creating more opportunities for interaction is actually one of the things that they've asked most of us, and so we look for for ways to, to, to do that, to create conduits and, and opportunities for them to interact. Um, so I do think that there's there's ways to, to integrate them, um, mm -hmm. but keeping in mind the fact that the, the board is actually charged with, with specific duties that they need to be uh, maintaining in a way that you know, junior board members actually aren't participating in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, the next question that we have is from Erin, and she's asking, um, or, she, or she's sharing her experience and saying, we tried an advisory board in the past, and it was a bit dismissed as second tier, um, Heidi, you were alluding to this earlier, um, or, or not as prestigious as the real board. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any advice on how to avoid that type of uh, kind of labeling? You have to make them feel valued, and that's something that, you know, Lily and I um, are actually addressing um, right now. Um, you know, you have these young professionals who are giving their time, their talent, and everything, their networks and resources. Um, to drive the organization's mission. So, you know, again, they may not be bringing in as much as a governing board, but they're bringing in funds and um, connections that would otherwise not have been realized. So you have to show them that they're valued. Um, and it could be, you know, again, very small things where they are, you know, where they ha are they included in meetings? Uh, you know, are they um, being seated with board members at an event? Um, so you want to create, um, you definitely want to create that prestige of being on this non-governing board. Um, so, you know, again, I guess it's like just very small steps that you can take to ensure that that's happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if your question, Erin, is about uh, from within the organization, people are not seeing it as sort of valuable and, and worth resources, or whether um, in, in your attempts to recruit your or advisory board members, um, whether they felt like, they didn't want to be on just the junior board, for example. Um, so I think Annie got to a lot of that. I mean, uh, I, I, as I said earlier, I, I find our advisory council to be as important as our governing board. Um, if you're facing uh, obstacles from within your organization, that's really interesting. And again, I think that's where goal setting is going to come into play. Um, you know, maybe the, the advisory council doesn't raise as much money as, as Annie said as a governing board, but, you know, we have a fundraiser, and, and each of our junior board members brings five friends. 
So, you know, we have, you know, we get 150 to 200 people in the room who don't know about New York lawyers, and they leave knowing about us. And I consider that a wild success, you know, even if that, doesn't, that pales in comparison to our, you know, million dollar plus gala that we hold, you know, for for, for a much larger audience. Uh, so I, 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 I think setting those goals and achieving those goals um, absolutely lends it credibility and, and prestige is maybe the word that you use. Yeah. Um, and recognize, recognize their contributions. Um, I mean, I send that <coughs> on everything. Um, we recognize that someone has made a connection with a new um, donor or a new partner. Um, so, you know, recognize not just within the, the, the group itself and on governing board, but let the board of directors know that that's happening. Um, share it with senior leadership. Again, just develop that prestige. I think it's fairly easy to do because it doesn't require much. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So here, Erin did write back and clarified. Uh -huh. She says, it's the, the people that we're asking to join the advisory board are the ones that are posing the question, why wouldn't I be on the actual board? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if you again, if you have whether it's in document form or yeah. your own sort of criteria of what it is that you need, from a, what you're looking for in a board member versus what you're looking for in a junior board member, I think that's something that you can sort of talk about whether you're mm -hmm. prepared to do it explicitly or sort of you know implicitly. Uh, um, you know, frankly, for our governing board members, the financial contribution that they're asked to make is much more significant than what we're asking of, of junior board members. Um, they're also often asked to, to help with this, getting institutional gifts from their from their corporations mm -hmm. and, and law firms. Um, you know, and, and I don't know if that's necessarily the tag you want to take, but you know, that's, that's, there's sort of a big dividing line actually for, 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 for yeah, us. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Board, okay. Yeah, yeah and Erin, if they're, they're asking about why they can't actually be on the board, um, I would say, I mean, again, up front for during re the recruiting process um, and onboarding um, phase, expectations and goals should be clearly set out so that they understand what their role is and not asking why they should be on, an act you know, on the actual board. Um, and although we at Team Bank sort of have fundamental expectations of our group, they're not limited to that. If someone wants to give more than what they were supposed to give, that's absolutely welcome. If someone, um, and I can give an example, one of our junior board members reading um, a newspaper or LinkedIn and saw that um, an online wholesaler had this whole philanthropic arm and she just sort of decided to reach out to them um, and see what kind of partnership is explore a partnership with Food Bank. And that has resulted in, um, you know, a significant, um, you know, dollar donation from them. So I think you kind of make the role what it is you want it to be, mm -hmm. but you know, sort of be mindful of what the fundamental expectations are, right? Mm -hmm. um, and as you mentioned, the financial contribution that um, a sort of governing board member is expected to give is, you know, significantly higher than what non-governing boards are asked. Mm -hmm. so. It's also an opportunity where if you're you recruit using your junior board members to recruit and they're asking their colleagues and their friends, um, they tend to be at you know similar professional levels. And so you know, I think it, it becomes more of a natural fit for why you're being asked to be on a, on a young professional board as opposed to a governing board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, very quickly here, uh, Sh uh, Sharmila is asking if if you have a sample tracking document that you can share. I think earlier you were talking about like um, creating a report card uh -huh. to kind of measure the success or the engagement of your board. Um, is there anything that you would be able to share with our audience? I, I think, uh, so I don't have the actual tracking document. I think really uses a specific um, uh, software to track mm -hmm. it, um, but I'm happy to share um, a report out with um, someone. It's really not much because we sort of identified the three or four things that we're expected to do. So we, um, it's really just a listing of, you know, have you met your gift yet? How much you've met? How many times have you volunteered? If your expectation is, you know, twice in a year, how many fundraising events have you attended? Um, but I, yeah, I'm happy to share sure. it out with you all. Wonderful. And as soon as, um, uh, as soon as Annie uh, sends us the, the link, we will be including that um, in the email that we will be sending out to everyone who registered. Um, uh, which you should be getting, uh, if not tomorrow, in the next couple of days. Um, so moving on to our next question, and this is great. Uh, just a, uh, very quickly, I'm going to pause and just thank our audience for being so engaged with us today. We are getting so many questions here. 
um, and it's wonderful to see um, your interest in the subject. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Heidi and Annie, you're doing a wonderful job. So thank you again. Um, so this is a, a very kind of a, a positive question here that Kelly is asking. Uh, what are some of the best things that you've seen a junior board do? Uh, what are maybe some success stories that you could share with our audience? So the one that I mentioned, mentioned just sort of, again, I always bring it up because I talk a lot about wearing your food bank lens in your everyday life so that when opportunities present themselves to you and you're considering this as you know, an opportunity for my professional life, my personal life, you also think, wait, can this be something for food bank? And um, I think that's exactly what this board member was doing. She had on her food bank lens when she was reading this article about the, um, the online um, food distributor. So I think you know, again, having someone even think that far, and again, on a junior board where you've got fundamental expectations, but you're not limited by that, you're sort of thinking outside of the box. So I think that was, um, you know, and we've had, you know, more than one of those, and we've had people who brought in um, significant dollar donations from their professional networks. Um, we have, I believe, um, we, so we set a goal as a whole for the board um, that we have a fundraising goal for the entire board, which also includes our gift yet. But we try to hit the target by having um, smaller events and two large events throughout the year. Um, and the way the junior board sort of uh, mobilizes and comes together to pull off these events, at, you know, all these cool spaces that I would never have been able to go. Um, it's impressive to see such a diverse group, um, you know, work together. And I'm happy about that. Um, Food Bank has made great strides, I think, in bringing a diverse group of leaders to the table. Um, our group is 80% women and 50% um, people of color. Um, so they're definitely making a monumental change um, with, with the diversity deficit in nonprofit leadership. Um, but again, I think just seeing that diverse group come together and achieve what it has achieved in, you know, just two years of being together mm -hmm. is quite impressive. That's wonderful. Anything you want to share? Um, yeah. So we, um, as, you know, one of the goals of this our Junior Board Advisory Council is been, been its own guest fundraiser. Um, and for a long time, we used to do sort of uh, uh, at an art gallery, we used to serve wine and cheese, and it was kind of a very, it was a very nice event, a sort of classy event. Um, but you know, at some point, our junior board said to us, you know, we want to do something social, like something that's more fun and more raucous, and you know, more of a relaxed time. Uh, so we talked about dodgeball, we talked about rock climbing and bowling, and sort of all these different ideas. And then, you know, they sort of called in and wanted to do a trivia night. Uh, and uh, so we were like, great, well, let's shift gears. Well, let's try the trivia night. And the trivia night has been an absolute smash for us. Um, <laughs> it's super fun. We, people tell us that their friends are saying to them, when is trivia night? When is that happening? You know, we can't wait. If you can imagine, lawyers get very competitive. So, <laughs> <laughs> they do not. <laughs> so they bring teams. You know, I think one of our one of our um, advisory board members uh, brought a team of partners and a team of associates, and they play partners with his associates. Wow. Um, so they, but they really like took ownership of the event. And, <clears throat> and instead of sort of just saying, you know, fine, whatever you guys think, we'll do it. They, they actually said, like, no, let's let's mm -hmm. make some changes. Let's, let's change it up. Let's, try something new, um, and it was uh, really fantastic, and uh, it, we've done it now for several years, and it, it's grown every year, and uh, it, it's really one of my favorite things that we do as a group, and, and I think a real example of how when they take ownership of something, it, it becomes something uh, that they, they can be really proud of. That's wonderful, and it also just goes to show that, you know, um, how creative you can be within the work that you do, right? I think as nonprofits, we tend to like focus a lot on like the same events that we all do over mm -hmm. and over again, like mm -hmm. galas mm -hmm. and you know, fun a fundraiser and it's a, but you know, a junior board or or an advisory council or you know whatever we may want to call it really brings in kind of those fresh new yeah. ideas that yeah. we probably wouldn't want yeah. to, wouldn't dare to Absolutely. try otherwise, right? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Um, so we have uh, more questions here for you. Uh, so uh, with two of our audience members are asking, um, would asking, so when deciding how much to ask a board, a, a non-governing board member to contribute, is it okay to ask them for a percentage of their income as an annual contribution? Is that appropriate? And if so, what would be an acceptable amount? What would be an acceptable percentage? 
There's some like. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of anyone doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't do it. Or yeah. Do yeah. Um, it's usually an actual dollar amount that's yeah, being asked I, yeah, for. I, I think even at um, something board level, too, there's yeah. usually a minimum. Yeah, there's, um, there's usually a dollar amount. Actually, yeah. Yeah. But that also seems, you know, groups, and I think even in an earlier version, is a personally significant contribution. Yes. Where there's no, so there's no number. specific dollar mm -hmm. amount. Um, uh, so I think that's possible. Um, you know, in terms of setting setting what that number is for you, I mean, that's so hard to say. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. Really personal. I think, you know, again, for us, we're a legal services organization, so we are almost exclusively lawyers at, at big law firms. So that sort of sets us at a, you know, it gives us sort of a, a baseline of what we think might be an appropriate number. You know, it's right. not $20 a year when you're right. asking, you know, lawyers right. at big law firms. Um, <clears throat> but that being said, you know, I we work with, you know, a board consultant. I remember, and he talked about, he worked at a, with a domestic violence organization where, you know, survivors of domestic violence, you know, some of them were on the mm -hmm. advisory council, and he said, you know, these are women who don't have anything, and they are able to fundraise, and they're able to put together what is personally yeah. significant to them, and that's yeah. absolutely important. Yeah. So, yeah. again, if, it, if it's something where you're wanting to engage your constituents and clients there, right. you know, I think you want to keep that in mind, yeah. or if it's something where you're yeah. targeting, you know, high-level professionals, um, it, it really just, I think you should be flexible. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really glad that you bring up that point, because I think that's the big misconception, right? One of our one of our other audience members is um, saying, "Well, our our board is made up of all nonprofit staff, mm -hmm. so they can't mm -hmm. they, they can't mm -hmm. contribute mm -hmm. financially." Right. Mm -hmm. And what what you're saying, what I'm hearing you say, Heidi, Heidi is, um, they may not be able to contribute a, you know the same amount as like a Wall Street mm -hmm. finance person would, right. but right. there is an amount that would be comfortable for them and significant, for, absolutely, yeah. of, of significance for them as well. So absolutely. you should give everyone a chance. Um, uh, it seems what you're saying is also assess the background mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. your of your board members, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then based on that, kind of decide, you know, what a, a reasonable amount would be to ask of them. Yeah, we actually had we used to have a couple of people who were at nonprofits on the junior board, and we set a different amount for them. We just yeah. we thought we thought it was absolutely appropriate to think about um, the fact that they're not making the same salaries of their colleagues. Yeah, and we set a lower amount for them. Um, but again, I think it's, it's thinking about know what it is that you want from, from the yeah. group and, and not want right. to bar people also with being on it. We've also, I mean, frankly, we've had conversations with attorneys at law firms who will say, I can't make that level of contribution right now, but here's what I'm comfortable with. And we talk to them and say, oh, well, let's talk about this, you know, can we get to this level in a couple of years or next year or whatever. Mm -hmm. and so again, we're, we're being explicit, we're having the conversation, we're talking about our goals, and, I, and you know, when we get to a place where we can all be happy. Right. And so, it's always, it doesn't have to be donations in dollars. It could be in kind donations, mm -hmm. too, so that if someone is, like, you know, an expert marketer um, and the, the services that they're providing, that should also be factored into their gift get, I believe. So, um, again, it's, you know, it doesn't always have to be a dollar amount. We should look at it holistically. Great. Yes, that's great. So uh, we have one more question here to take, and that is, other than the satisfaction of helping a nonprofit accomplish its mission, are there other incentives that are effective at recruiting and engaging junior board members? Um, so I guess I guess what you're trying to say is, how can you position this also as a benefit for them, right, not just for for the nonprofit. Any thoughts on that? I mean, one big, I think, compelling thing, and it's a little bit mm -hmm. tricky because it's sort of a chicken and egg situation, is uh, the opportunity to network with the other people who are on the advisory council. Now, of course, how do you get the first group of people on there so that they are in a compelling incentive? Um, that could be, you know, sort of a little bit chicken and egg. Um, mm -hmm. but, I, but I do think that the opportunity to meet other professionals um, is, is a big draw for people. Yeah. I agree, and I, I think, um, and that's what we've sort of been touching on throughout, you know, making sure that this is a mutually beneficial relationship and that we're not just, um, you know, asking and taking from them, but also giving them opportunities to develop as well. Um, and I think at this, um, usually at, you know, most junior board um, or non-governing board members are at that stage where they're trying to build their um, professional brands and personal brands, so you could definitely leverage that in programming um, geared towards uh, satisfying that to make your non governing board more attractive. Mm -hmm. Any additional thoughts? Um, just before we before we close and before we uh, we uh, end our discussion today, and we will still take a couple more questions. I just wanted to uh, make our audience aware of additional programming that we have coming up. 
Um, so you will see here uh, on your screen, we have two um, live online trainings. One is uh, Skills for Overcoming Burnout, Refueling the Fire. So this is also part of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion um, webinar series. Uh, and we are going to have uh, one of our colleagues, um, Ariana Schindel uh, from the RISA Collective that is going to be, uh, as part of this conversation, we'll be talking about self-care, like as, as leaders uh, in social justice, as leaders in the social sector, how do we take care of ourselves, right? Many times we're too busy taking care of others. Um, how do we take care of ourselves and how do we make sure that we don't burn out? Um, and then she will also be leading us through a, a a, a healing kind of session during during the webinar itself. So join us for that. And then also we have um, shifting the narrative to advance racial equity um, that is going to be taking place on April 9th. Um, and you will definitely find more information on both of those um, on the links provided um, on your screen. Um, so we're going to continue here with questions. We have about five more minutes left before we end the webinar. Um, the uh, the next question here comes from um, Andrea, and uh, they ask recommendations for developing or managing a junior board for a national organization. Mm -hmm. um, are there any any differences that you might um, identify, and, and do you have any recommendations for that? Specifically, um, asking them to help raise money and awareness across the country. Any thoughts on that? That's tricky. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, frankly, getting everyone together in the same room is a Yeah, I mean, it's a challenge right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah very local. Yeah. So, um, it's, yeah. it's a challenge, but also it's a great opportunity to get people excited. Mm -hmm. um, we you know, have, you know, staff that can come in and present to people so we can hear more about what we're doing in-house. Um, obviously, some of these things can happen by phone, um, but we actually really try to encourage people to come in person for our meetings mm -hmm. when we can. Um, and then, like I said, it'll be, we have our annual fundraiser, which can do together. So in terms of trying to do it nationally, um, I mean, obviously some of these things, you know, aren't going to work. You can't have one central fundraiser for the whole group. But, you know, I think something I've seen that's been super interesting at both actually the governing board and non-governing board levels is individual members sort of hosting almost their own small events, whether it's like a dinner in their home or, you know, a um, hosted event going to a museum and looking at an exhibit together. Um, and uh, and try to find you know smaller opportunities where again they can just bring some of their friends, invite ten friends, or mm -hmm. invite a friend and have them bring a friend, you know, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, and and you know do something on a smaller scale again where most likely they're not going to have the resources of a staff person right there who's literally going to help them call venues and you know identify uh, uh, the the people that you need to help support those kinds of events. Um, I think I think keeping probably the events themselves smaller would, would be more productive and also will be more personal. It's something that actually I would like to do even even though we're geographically all here in New York. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something that I think growing I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Anecdotally I will say Foundation Center does have advisory boards of, in various cities across the country. We are a national organization. Mm -hmm. So we do have an advisory board in San Francisco, mm -hmm. one in Atlanta, one in you know wherever we have an office. Uh, but we also have staff in these other cities that are managing those advisory boards. So if that is maybe you know um, mm -hmm. if that is how you are structured, maybe that is an option for your organization right. um, to okay. have you know local advisory boards in the cities where you might yeah. have you know operations. Yeah, and I think you obviously make um, you know, with technology it's so easy to um, to do information sharing now. Um, and I think if you are having um, boards that are sort of spread out geographically, there should be maybe executive committees that can, you know, it might be a challenge to get all of the non-governing board members in a room, but it might be, um, you know, less challenging to get maybe the executive committees to maybe form or identify one or two people on these national boards to get together um, so that we, you know, to, to facilitate information sharing mm -hmm. and keep each other apprised of what's going on in their um local factions, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, and we have, uh, let's see, a few more questions here. Uh, Roberta is asking, um, if you are recruiting volunteers for a non-governing board and you need them to help with planning new programs, should you have them sign a non-disclosure agreement? I ask because we are uh, new and have no money and we want to plan some new programs that other nonprofits are not doing and we don't want any competitors jumping ahead of us and doing the programs that we are planning to do. I don't know that there's a written rule on it. I mean, I'm guessing a conversation with a volunteer and letting them know, um, you know, that 
whatever the discussion is going to be about new programming that shouldn't be discussed should be sufficient to, um, you know, bar them from speaking about it or sharing it with others. Um, again, obviously, if you got access to legal counsel, I would probably speak to them about how best to, to traverse that. Right? I, I don't know if that's... Yeah, um, again, I don't, I don't know that non-disclosure agreements are so, like, common. Common, in, yeah. You know, especially in a non-profit. Um, and I'm not saying you can't do it again, but um, I would sort of think about the tone you're setting by handing someone an, a, an MBA, um, as opposed to, you know, saying, well, this is, you know, we're really excited about this event, and we'd love to sort of be an innovator and a leader in this area. And yeah, we'd like to sort of added internal, pressure. <laughs> yeah. Um, rather than yeah. taking a piece of paper like you Sign in front of them. Yeah. 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 So you would recommend it again. 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 Yeah. That's, that's interesting. That's great. Well, ladies, uh, we have reached uh, the end of our uh, webinar program for today. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, uh, Heidi and Annie, uh, your insight has been absolutely valuable. Um, and also, I want to thank our audience members. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. We hope that you have. Uh, that, that you have enjoyed um, our webinar program. Um, so on behalf of Foundation Center and our presenters and on behalf of Elizabeth and myself, I want to thank you again for joining us today. If you like this webinar, we hope that you will return and we hope that you will also share on social media uh, and uh, have a great rest of your day. And for those of you that are in cold states, stay warm. Um, and, uh, and yes, and take care. Have a good day. Bye-bye.